everybody, Terrence Pop here with another episode from the lair. <laughs> and uh, gonna throw some more uh, n my early uh, Ninth ID stories out there. Uh, you gotta remember that these early ones were basically the late 80s, which is a completely different world than it is today, but uh, some, of the sh some of the shit that went down is, you know, all young guys do it because they're just stupid and you pretty much make a bad decision every 60 days. And if you're lucky enough not to have one of them kill you when you get older, you know, you'll outgrow it, you know. So don't worry, youth is, you know, a terminal illness. Um, not always, but it can be. And if it's not, if it doesn't kill you, you know, sooner or later you outgrow it and that'll be that. So <laughs> what are you going to do? All right, here we go. All right, uh, let's see. Uh, I was in 347, uh, which is technically motorized infantry, which is basically straight leg infantry, just riding wearing a Humvee, which I don't know if they were just trying to work on that concept. I don't, I don't think there is any more motorized infantry anymore. Um, I think they built it off of a uh, German model. Uh, the Germans had some motorized uh, infantry units that were actually fairly effective, and especially in some of the Battle of the Bulge uh, counterattacks that they conducted. But that's just the history in me, the history buffing me talking about that. All right, so uh, we'd go up to Yakima like two to three, eh, sometimes more, like four to three times a year. And I was in the 9th Infantry Division, just a hair over two years, spent seven months deployed overseas to the MFO. Now, you know, we would go out there and, you know, Yakima Firing Center is just basically a dried out prairie windy as fuck uh, in the summertime it's hot as hell uh, in any other season it's uh, windy cold and it sucks and uh, doesn't really rain that much thank god but uh, still pretty cold so you know we'd go down there and you know I was a private I was you know basically an E3 at the time E2 E3 I don't remember but when you go down there all the lower lists have got to set all the shit up you know so uh, me and one of my buddies I used to hang out with, uh, you know, first name Mark. I'm not gonna say his last name. Uh, you know, and we have to, you know, put up the tents, and they're like circus tents back in the day. There's really no internal structure, just a few um, poles uh, made of wood, and a lot of these stupid ass wooden tent stakes, and we have to bash these things in with this huge wooden hammer or mallet, and it, I mean it's. It's pretty funny. I mean, it's about three feet long and there's a big hammer on the end. You smash it in. So, uh, you know, we have to do our fire guard or, or watch 24 hours. So at night, when everyone goes to sleep, they usually have a roster. You and the guys, you, you know, you and your bunk mate who are sharing a shelter half of this little pup tent. Uh, you do like an hour's worth of watch. You just walk around, and make sure there's no animals, no fires, or anyone else fucking with anything. So me and, uh, me and my buddy Mark, we're standing over by the HQ tent uh, that we just set that one up. And uh, I believe that was the same one that blew away that year. I'm not sure. Um, what are you gonna do? So we're, we're fucking around with these big hammers. You know, we're walking around, I'm holding the white light and the, the mice would come out and get into shit at night because you know, soldiers eat and spill everything everywhere. So we would occupy a lot of our time at night, you know, I'd be like, oh, I got one, and he, he would like smash it with a big mallet, or I'd smash him, and he'd, he'd flash the light. Uh, so one day we took, we started guard, it was right after chow-ish, you know, in the evening, about six o'clock, still a little light outside. Uh, and I'm like, hey, hey, uh, Mark, how about you put on your flat vest and K-Pot and I'm gonna hit you in the chest as mallet. You let me know if it hurts. He's, okay. <laughs> so I'm like, all right, here we go. <laughs> Boom, I hit him right in the chest, knock him on his ass. He's like, wow, this vest does take a lot of force. It knocked the wind at me a little bit, but it wasn't that bad. So <laughs> we spent like 20 minutes just bashing each other with this fucking hammer and fall out of the ground and you know our squad leader would sit there and watch and then finally after we got knocked down three or four times he walks out and he's like what the fuck are you guys doing uh we're just fucking around with this hammer oh no oh, i was watching for 20 minutes you guys like 
If hit you sharp with a hammer? If, if you guys get fucking hurt, you're gonna get fucked up because this is intentional shit here. I'm like, all right, well, so we quit doing it. But uh, it kind of caught on and a lot of other people were doing the same thing. And one guy did get a broken rib, but uh, I think that was more of a surprise thing because he didn't have his vest on. You know, the vest really did work. <laughs> uh, let's see, on that particular uh, Yakima journey, we went on this, uh, 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 we linked up with two other battalions and we're gonna do this attack up Yakima Ridge to the top and they, were, they set up an objective up there and, and my company, you know, we were all, all online, each of the three platoons and the headquarters was behind us. We start walking up this goddamn Yakima Ridge. Now if you have Google Earth, you can find it. Um, it's pretty fucking uh, tall and uh, you know, we started just after it got dark, and it wasn't that bad in the beginning. Uh, but then, you know, the temperature went way down, and uh, there was basically, I don't know, fog and low clouds. And uh, we're like an hour into it, still walking up this goddamn ridge. And it was weird because you'd go, like, oh yeah, there's the top, and you come, you crawl, you go over the top, and then it would be another flat plateau. And you're like, ah oh, fuck, and you have to cross the three wire fence and go, oh, it's going up again. And it, it went on like five or six times like that. Like, oh, finally we're over. Well, long story short, we started at nine o'clock. Our company didn't make the top of the ridge until I would say 1.32 in the morning. Of all the people that were left on this particular you know, mission was me and I think seven other guys from our company. The rest had all fallen out or they, all, they, they just couldn't do it. I mean, you're walking uphill carrying all your shit. It's right on the verge of freezing. So, you know, people were uh, stopping and you know, stopping too long, getting cold and, you know, catching hypothermia. And the radios, of course, the, you know, those old uh, FM radios you can't fucking, they never work when you need them. It's Murphy's in your ass. Apparently they had canceled the whole thing uh, about two hours into it, but we didn't get that. So we walked all the way to the top. We get there and, you know, there's like four or five, uh, five tons up there just to drive everyone back down because they'd scrubbed the mission. It was so fucked up. Now that's probably um, up until that point, that was the most exhausted I had ever been in my entire life. Like literally, we were you know get out, getting on and off the five ton, waiting in line to get on. You're you're literally dozing off while you're standing up. And I hadn't experienced this kind of uh, tired until Ranger School would be like I think two years later or two or three years later. But man, oh man, fuck that place. Uh, and another thing is. We would set up our tents and they would put up a engineer tape and then we'd have to have the front pole of each one of our you know two-man tents on this engineer tape so you'd have the company set up and you'd have you know all the platoons uh, for such and such company then a, the other company from the battalion and the other so it looked like a big checkerboard with a bunch of tents now I you know I found out later that these motherfuckers did it on purpose but, uh, you know, they would fly, the Army pilots would fly the Chinooks, which is basically the, the two big, uh, you know, uh, propellers on the top. And you could carry about you know, between 30 and 50 guys on them, depending upon how loaded down they were with equipment. But uh, they generated so much prop wash that they would fly over the top. Of course, they'd do this lo a little on the low side over our little tent city and everyone's tent would just explode and shit would blow everywhere I, <laughs> you know and we'd bitch you know hey uh, can somebody like tell those guys not to fucking do that because it's it's fucking us up <laughs> towards the end we're going on the southern mission where they actually we were getting on the, the the shit hook and flying to another objective so we get on there and i had a you know i was sitting down next to one of the crew chiefs and there was an extra uh, headphones there that nobody was wearing so just for shits and giggles, I put it on so I could hear what the pilots are saying. And the entire time, they're fucking going, okay, so we're gonna, when we fly out of here, I want you to turn around and go right over the tent city so we can blow up some more of their tents and watch them go fucking crazy. And I'm like, those motherfuckers do this on fucking purpose. 
And yes, they do, those rat bastards. And uh, they probably still do the same shit today because uh, let's face it, pain looks good on other people and so does pandemonium. <laughs> I'm just saying. <laughs> All right, again, we're doing the Southern, so I think this is the second part of the devil worshiper guy. So he came back from his fucking stint at the uh, Army re-education re camp that they ran on North for. He got sent to another platoon, shocker, because nobody in our platoon wanted anything to do with this guy. And uh, we were doing this long movement uh, on foot. I think we're four, uh, two hours into it, and we're supposed to get, be somewhere by two in the morning. Well, apparently, Mr. Devil Whisperer had talked to the chaplain and let him know that this was a uh, winter solstice, and he needed to have 15 minutes at midnight for his uh, to, to practice his religious freedom. So he actually, you know, the chaplain actually went to the commander and said, "Hey, uh, I know oh, this is this wrong, but uh, yeah, I don't see, I don't agree with it. But you know, I'm the chaplain, and one of our guys here, you know, today is the winter solstice, and he wants to, you know, stop to do 15 minutes uh, ritual to, you know, for his religious beliefs." My commander and first sergeant were fucking livid. They're like, fuck that guy. We're not going to fucking do that. And the chaplain's like, you know, technically, sir, you know, if you don't do it, it's, uh, it's, it is an IG complaint. And, uh, you know, it's fucked up. So sure as shit, at 1145, we all fucking stop. And this motherfucker who's in another platoon, we can see him walking up there with the chaplain up on the top of this fucking hill. A little bit windy, you can see him build a fire, some shit going on. And I remember I'm sitting there like eating fucking uh, a half warmed up beef stew with some crackers and standing right next to me is Crowley and he's looking up there he's like, dude, this, sh this shit's just fucked up, man. No, 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 fuck that guy. <laughs> I just laughed my fucking ass off. Uh, and, and another thing in regards to Crowley, you know, I told you he was a big dude. And uh, big, strong guy, but uh, when it came to the infantry stuff with like the road marching or having to run, and you know, he was good to a certain extent, but you know, in the infantry, your body size works against you. And the cutoff is right around 200 to 210, depending upon who you are. When you go more than 210, you know, you are actually fucking yourself in the long run. I'm just gonna tell you. I seen old big boy Crowley didn't make it, make it the march up yet. My ridge fell out a bunch of runs. Usually ran out of gas somewhere between 10 miles to 12 miles into a long movement. It was like clockwork. What are you gonna do? But for shorter movements, you know, we, he would carry them 60 the radio and an ass load of ammunition. It was like goddamn water buffalo. And as long as it didn't go over, you know, six to eight miles, you're good. All right, let's see. <sighs> I think that's about it for the Yakima stories. I got a few more. Uh, anyway, I hope you guys enjoy this. Uh, these are quick ones, uh, but I'll talk to you later.